next speaker is um, another colleague, Dr. James Hard, who's an NHR clinical lecturer um, at uh, Imperial College and also works at Imperial College NHS Trust. Um, James um, has been given the task um, and the tough task of talking about cardiopulmonary exercise testing and cardiomopsy. So thanks very much for agreeing to give this talk, James. Very much looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can indeed, yeah, and your Good. slides are up. Excellent. OK, so yes, I'm James Howard. I'm a clinical lecturer at Imperial and I report the CPETs R service. Um, and today we're going to talk about what a CPET is, why we do it, when we shouldn't do it, which numbers in the report matter, and then hopefully have enough time to go through some example cases. So a CPET should look a bit like this, um, either on a treadmill or a bike. Anaesthetists tend to like bikes, but cardiologists would tend to be used to the Bruce protocol and things like that, so we often use treadmills. But they give you the same numbers. What they give you are, they give you an estimate of workload, um, which is in watts or mets. They give you a continuous ECG and also a blood pressure. They give you oxygen saturations. They also give you the breath to breath ventilation. So how much um, air is coming in and out of the patient's lungs, the rate at which their body is consuming oxygen and also producing CO2. So we get lots of numbers. So when should we use it? When should we calculate all these numbers? Well, um, the ESC guidelines give it a class one level of evidence C indication in the guidelines for heart failure. So they say people who are being considered for a transplant should have a CPET. But there's some other useful times, I think. So perioperative risk assessment is the other very common use of it, mainly by anaesthetists. But also it's very useful in identifying our patients when they have pathology, if they are or aren't complaining of symptoms, and we're not quite sure sure about that. And also sometimes in identifying what the cause of that symptom might be if it's something as vague as breathlessness. So when shouldn't we see PET? Well, most of the situations are pretty obvious. They're the acutely unwell and people with uncontrolled illnesses such as heart failure. But the big one that we must always remember is symptomatic aortic stenosis. That's the one where you really shouldn't be putting them on a treadmill. The relative contraindications list is a bit funnier because it actually includes a lot of diagnoses that we routinely do do CPEP for, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and pulmonary hypertension. But the reason this list exists is to help guide you to decide the kind of cases where maybe you should be thinking about doing supervised CPEPs because these just patients are just a little bit more risky. Preparing the patient for it, it's very straightforward. Don't tell them to stop their beta blockers, okay? It's not like an exercise test. We want to get to a certain heart rate. What we're doing here is we're trying to see how well our patient is, how fit they are whilst they're on their maximal optimal medical therapy. Now, we do tell people to avoid caffeine and alcohol and cigarettes, and that is important, but even more important is don't let them drink a can of Coke in the two hours leading up to the test. Because if they go and have a can of fizzy drinks, which is full of carbon dioxide, and then through the test, they're exhaling all this carbon dioxide in their stomach, you're going to think they're anaerobically respiring at rest and all the numbers are going to be wrong. So that one is important, much more important than caffeine and alcohol. And then the other thing is, if your centre does not do spirometry as part of the CPET, make sure you get it beforehand because a lot of the um, measurements we do do require accurate spirometry. So when to stop it? Basically, very rarely, OK, nearly always it should be the patient asking you to stop it. Do not stop it when they get to the target heart rate. This is not about target heart rate. This is about maximal exercise capacity. If it's not the patient stopping it, the only times the doctor should be doing it is if the ECG is becoming very abnormal, the blood pressure is becoming very high or very low, or they're profoundly desaturating or their mental state is altering. Otherwise, just keep encouraging them. So that's the introduction. So let's go through the numbers. Now, you've probably seen things like this before. It looks very intimidating, but what it includes really, and these, this is where all the good stuff is, this is the nine panel plot. And it's broken down as far as I can tell fairly arbitrarily, but the left three panels are to do with the lungs. These three panels are to do with the heart and the other three panels are kind of ventilation, perfusion, matching a bit of the two. So. If I was asked to give a 15 minute talk on CPET after groaning, what I'd probably do is I'd limit it to four measures, which will be these four, which I think are the most important for you to know about. They probably have the best evidence and they're the most useful. The first is the peak VO2, which is the overall fitness. Then the uh, thing called the RER, the respiratory exchange ratio, which will help us figure out if this test we've just done is accurate. Then the OUES, which will help us identify if there's a heart problem, and then the breathing reserve, which will help us figure out if there's a lung problem.
OK, so I've written VO2 peak here, not VO2 max. That's because what we measure in a CPET may not necessarily be that patient's VO2 max. The VO2 max is what a patient could do if they were to push themselves to the absolute limit. But maybe if they've got arthritis or lots of anxiety or they don't have confidence, they may not get there. So what you measure is the VO2 peak. So the VO2 peak which also is called the VO2 max by most people, is this plot in the top right corner. And if we zoom in on that, we can see VO2 is marked in red. And if we read it off, it comes to about 2.6 in this patient. And it's very clear this is above the reference red shaded region, which is a good thing. So we've got our VO2 max that we've read off, or our VO2 peak. And this is our, as I said, maximal exercise capacity. It's our best measure of how fit the patient is. And it has by far the best evidence of anything else in exercise testing. So as a Wace had in his talk earlier on, it was the second thing in his list of things that help them decide if they're going to put the patient on the active transplant list. And that's because if your VO2 max is less than 14 mils per kilo per minute, you have around an 80% one year mortality in the historic cohorts but if it's greater than 20 that's only five percent now we often do it in terms of percentage prediction now so we don't say less than 14 as much as we say less than 50 percent predicted that just gives you an idea of how important this information is however there's two problems with vo2 max or vo2 peak the first is is this a maximal test? Like I said, a lot of people may not push themselves to the limit and we need to know if the low value we've recorded is actually that patient's genuine maximal exercise tolerance or whether they it wasn't a maximal test, whether it was a submaximal test. The second thing is it doesn't tell you where the problem is. You will have a low VO2 max if it's lungs, if it's heart, if it's muscle, if it's mitochondria, it can be anywhere along the chain. So we do need to look at other numbers. So then we move into the next step. And the thing I want to talk about is this thing called the respiratory exchange ratio. And we read this off of these two plots that I've highlighted. The RER is simply the ratio at which your body is producing carbon dioxide to the ratio it's uh, consuming oxygen. OK, and the theory behind this is when someone is at their peak VO2, when they're really, really pushing themselves, as we all know, you start having anaerobic respiration. And your muscles start making lactic acid. Now, that lactic acid reacts with the bicarbonate in your blood a process called buffering and that produces carbon dioxide and the way we get rid of that carbon dioxide is by your lungs breathing it off so if we really force a patient to exercise as hard as they can we should suddenly see more co2 being produced as they exercise more and more and we say that if the rer does not go above 1.15 it's probably a submaximal test you probably haven't got a good estimate of that patient's true vo2 max the other thing we could do is we can look at when in the test, how far in they started suddenly producing all that extra CO2. We call that the anaerobic threshold. And if that happens quite early, it implies that the patient isn't very isn't able to do much exercise before their body is becoming anaerobic. And that's particularly useful in things like perioperative risk stratification for anaesthetists. Um, and then the next step, as we said, after the RER is we want to look at the heart. So there's two measures we use here um, and we can read them off this plot. So the first is the oxygen pulse and traditionally this is um, the main one. And the oxygen pulse, it sounds very complicated, but all it is is our VO2. So how much oxygen we're producing in a minute divided by our heart rate. So that gives us a measure of how much oxygen we pump around the blood in each heartbeat. And logically it follows that that might be quite a good surrogate for stroke volume. Um, and it does actually have some prognostic useful information in people with heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. Um, but the thing is, there's lots of other things that make your oxygen pulse um, low. Anemia, diffusion problems, right to left shunts, low peripheral oxygen extraction. And in fact, Tony Barron's PhD showed it didn't really help discriminate between heart failure and COPD patients well at all. So instead, we use something different called the OUES. And the OUES is a long word. Uh, long term, it's the oxygen uptake efficiency slope. But all it's doing is for a certain amount of ventilation, how much oxygen are you getting out? OK, so it's your efficiency of oxygen extraction. And the logic behind this is COPD patients have low VO2 maxes, but that's because their minute ventilations are low. They're not breathing in out very much. 
heart failure patients have low VO2 maxes despite relatively normal minute ventilations. And therefore, this measure discriminates between those two. And it's a, the strongest discriminator we have at identifying whether it's a cardiac or a non-cardiac cause. And then step four, just before we get into some cases, is we want to think about ventilation. So um, we've got these three plots for ventilation. The top two, oh, before we look at this, remember to look at the spirometry and also look at the SATS trace, which for reasons I've never really understood are in plot nine. But um, then look at these three plots. But if you could only look at one, don't look at these two, look at this one. So this one, the rationale behind this plot is healthy people should never be limited by their respiration. So if you are all healthy people and I made you run really hard on a treadmill, when you were exhausted, you could still breathe that in and out a bit more. It will be something else holding you back, maybe your heart, maybe your muscles, but it will be very unlikely to be your lungs. So what we do is we look at people's spirometry, we find that FEV1 and then we multiply it by 40 and we draw that line on this graph in the bottom right and we see how close people are to that limit at the end of exercise. So here you can see there's about a 20% gap at the end between their peak um, tidal volume and their maximum voluntary ventilation, as we call it. If that is greater than 20%, it is unlikely to be a breathing problem holding this patient back. If it's less than 20%, it's increasingly likely. So that's our best measure for saying whether there's a lung issue uh, limiting this patient's exercise. So let's do some cases. So 45 year old regular runner with mild asthma. He's had palpitations the last few weeks. He has booper at work and therefore he's got a free CPET. So um, I'll give you some numbers. He's got a relatively normal ECG. And these are the numbers we've talked about today that I've given you broken down. And this is his nine panel plot. So we're going to very quickly go through this in a systematic manner. So he's got a normal VO2 max. So we can read this off in the top right. It's above the reference range. He's got an RER of 1.3. So that's above 1.15. So we're pretty sure we've got a good estimate of his true VO2 max. His oxygen pulse rises throughout exercise, but more importantly, his OUES is 95% predicted. So it's essentially normal. His SATs don't drop during exercise, his spirometry is OK, and importantly, in this bottom left plot, he's got a good breathing reserve. That gap at the end is greater than 20%. So this is a normal CPET. This is what a normal CPET looks like. Next case, 68-year-old, no past medical history, ex-smoker, it's very short of breath and climbing stairs. So this is ECG, we won't dwell on it. Um, these are the numbers that we gave you in the last case. Um, and this is his nine panel plot. So let's do this again systematically. We'll start with the VO2 max. And if we read that off the plot in the top right corner, it's only 60% of what we predict for him. OK, so this is a moderate limitation of exercise capacity. His RER is above 1.15. It's 1.4. So we think this is a maximal test. It's not that he hasn't tried hard. His oxygen pulse is relatively flat, and even more importantly, his OUES and that table in the top is only 65% of predicted. And if you and his SATs are relatively stable, and importantly, he's got plenty of breathing reserves. So the gap in the bottom left corner is massive. It's approaching 50%. So he's definitely not held back by his lungs. So this is a CPET of a moderate cardiac limitation. All right, another one. 78 year old woman, pre-up assessment for abdominal aortic aneurysm. And she says, I have to stop after climbing a flight of stairs. She's got hypertension, but she's also on a blue inhaler and she's got a bit of peripheral edema. So this is her test. I'll tell you, she's got a normal ECG and these are her numbers. And this is her nine panel plot. So again, we'll start off looking at the VO2 max. So 70% of what it should be. So she's got a sort of mild limitation of exercise capacity. The RER, again, it is above 1.15, so we're comfortable with saying that's a genuine limitation. The oxygen pulse increases through exercise, but more importantly, her OUES is normal. It's 98% of what it should be. But her FEV1 to FEC ratio, if you look at the spirometry above, both are low and the FEV1 is particularly low. And she has no breathing reserve in the bottom left plot. OK, so there's no gap between her tidal volume and her maximum estimated ventilation. So this is a mild to moderate respiratory limitation that this lady has.
Good. So uh, 15 seconds left. So CPET in summary, useful for prognostication, um, especially for guiding transplant decisions. But it's also quite useful, I think, in identifying the cause of exercise limitations people with breathlessness and maybe also reassuring some people who have more subjective symptoms. Um, in terms of useful measures, in the prognostic sense, VO2 max predominates. There's another thing called ventilatory efficiency, which we didn't talk about today, and also anaerobic threshold, which you touched on briefly. But also the other two things that are particularly important, I think, if you're starting to read these reports, are the OUES and the breathing reserve, because there's what will tell you whether it's mainly a heart problem or mainly a lung problem. Thank you. And um, this is my mental flow chart for how I report them. So if you thought, CPET reporting was particularly difficult. I can show you it's not. Super. Thanks very much, James. That was a really wonderful talk, making CPET understandable uh, to, to, to all of us. So, yes, thank you very much. Um, we're going to